And they said, yes. And everybody was terrified of this woman. So I said, Lord, I need to get on campus. I can't afford the commute anymore. So how do I do it? And the Lord said, find out when is her birthday. <laughs> so I asked, and her birthday was in three days. And I went down the store and bought a large bouquet of flowers. And took it and put it on her desk, but she wasn't there. The next morning, my phone rang because I had submitted my list. And she said, Denton, I said, yes. She's, she's very rough, you know. Denton, yes, this is Mrs. I won't say her name. You may come on Friday and pick up the key for the efficiency apartment. <laughs> she knew exactly what I wanted. And there's a, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a young man on campus, I miss him. Um, you know, uh, there's an old Jamaican proverb, I don't know if it's in other, other, other cultures. It says, the humblest calf suck the most milk. You ever heard that? It's the same thing, the humblest calf. You know what that means, right? Suck the most milk. The one that is not fighting all the time. It's the same thing we're saying. The way to be happy is to make others happy. And there's a student on campus. He's not the brightest. He's not the most handsome. He doesn't come from any good family. He was converted out of the ghetto. He was a former Rastafarian, a street boy. And he was converted. He has a tendency for academics, however, but he doesn't speak the Queen's English as we should. Doesn't dress right. He's mismatched. And he's not popular because he just don't fit in. But there's something about him. He's very helpful and very humble. And he came to the dean's office consistently how can i help you what do you need i'm moving my books is there he finds out every need and he fills it i'm getting ready to do anything he's there with his hands to help are you with me until after a while i grew attached to this gentleman some time ago he said he did painting i said where were you before he said i was painting with my uncle who is a contractor and he said i'm a more i'm more of a christian than a painter and he fired me because i was always telling everybody that comes there about jesus and he said go to school go be a minister you're not a contractor and i heard that there's a friend of mine who is a single mom who lost her job she just adopted a baby and then she lost her job and she had a car payment and she had just bought a house. Now that is huge. So when she called, she was in major depression. But the house she was just, just bought a fixer upper. And I called this gentleman. I said, you're a painter. I'm going to ask you to go by and paint the front of the house for her. He went over there to spend a day painting. He spent three weeks. Painted the front and the back. And then the entire house. And then he moved inside. And they kept calling me because I had to keep buying paint. But he became endeared to that lady. And became very helpful. And so on campus, as he began to help us, when I was asked to find, when someone called the university and said, I have a large scholarship for a worthy student, I submitted his name. And all his fees for the next four years are paid. Amen. Because of his humility and his helpfulness. Once you honor God, he'll honor you. Once you're helpful, he'll help you. Once you're humble, take your eyes off yourself. Take your eyes off your problem and focus on Jesus. And help those who don't deserve it. Don't only help the deserving. But even those who don't deserve, sometimes they're the ones with the greatest need. Is that all right? We're here this morning for the, for the word. That's why we're supposed to be here. I'm speaking on a topic this morning, God's frustration. And I'm tempted most Sabbath to rush to the half an hour. But because I only have a few moments with you, and then you, the devil have you all week, I need to spend time with you on God's word. 
so that when you leave here, you can deal with them. God's frustration, that's our topic. Take your Bibles and turn with me to James. The book of James. All right, it's way down there. And I want to look at it from two versions this morning. James chapter 3. And I'm reading from the New Living Translation. And then I'm reading from a new Bible they put out, the Passion Bible. Let us pray. Father God, as I open your word, and as we decide to read, may your Holy Spirit stand by your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The Bible says, and I read from the New Living Translation. Dear brothers and sisters, not many of you listen to the word of God. Listen to God's word. God's frustrations, and I want you to, as I preach, to, 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 to find out why Dr. Rohn would select a topic like that. God's frustration. And what is it? Dear brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers in the church. <laughs> or leaders. It's the Bible, you know. For we who teach will be judged more strictly. Indeed, we all make many mistakes. For if we could control our tongue, we would be perfect and could also control ourselves in any and every other way. Could I get a little more volume on this? We can make large horse go wherever we want by means of a small bit in its mouth. And a small rudder makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot chooses to go, even though the winds are strong. In the same way, the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches. But a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire, and the tongue is a flame of fire. It is a whole world of wickedness, corrupting your entire body. It can set your whole life on fire, for it is set on fire by hell itself. People can tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and fish. Verse 8, but no one can tame the tongue. That is serious, you know. It is restless and evil, full of deadly poison. Sometimes it praises our Lord and Father, and sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God. And so blessing and cursing come pouring forth out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. Does a spring of water bubble out with both fresh water and bitter water? Does a fig tree produce olives or grape produce figs? No. You can draw fresh water. You can't draw fresh water from a salty spring. This is the word of God. Let me start by saying something that you need to believe. There is nothing that you cannot do. And there is nothing that any of you in here cannot achieve. When God made you, he made a little piece of himself. And the same powers that he has, to a large extent, he has given it unto you. The power of speech. The ability to speak. Virtually everything you have, you have spoken it into existence. Everything. Somebody some time ago said, let's put a church here. This is how you have this building. Somebody about two years ago said, let's renovate the church. That's how you had a renovation. I wasn't here. Someone said, let's issue a call to Denton to be here. That's how I'm here. And I said, yes. I could have said no. 
That's why I'm here. Some time ago, you said to somebody, uh, 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 will you marry me? And they probably mistakenly said yes. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. But they said yes. And that's how you have your life. Everything that we have, whether our joy or our misery, you speak it into existence. Amen. Everything. And that is why it's important for us to learn to control our words. Amen. There's a poem. Um, I asked for it to be printed this morning. It was printed. And I have a few copies. I wanted one, but I have several. So if you want it at the church, you can have it. It is titled Kant by Edgar Guest. It says, Kant is the worst word that's written or spoken, doing more harm here than slander and lies. On it, many strong spirit broken, and with it, many good purpose dies. It springs from the lips of the thoughtless each morning and robs us of the courage we need through the day. It rings in our ear like a timely sent warning and laughs when we falter and fail by the way. Kant is the father of feeble endeavor, the parent of terror and half-hearted work. It weakens the efforts of artisan clever and makes of the toiler an indolent shirk. It poisons the soul of the man with a vision and stifles in infancy many a plan. It greets toil honest toiling with open derision and mocks at the hopes and fears, dreams of a man. Kant is a word none should speak without blushing. To utter it should be a symbol of shame. Ambition and courage it daily is crushing. It blights a man's purpose and shortens his aim. Despise it with all your hatred of error. Refuse its lodgment it seek in your brain. Arm against it as a creature of terror and all that you dream of someday you will gain. Three verses, but there's a fourth one. I won't read it now. Can't. The ability to control our speech is significant and that's a reason why God gave us his word can you say amen? amen yes the devil is fully aware of this power that we have and that is why for every gift that God gives us the devil presents a counterfeit I believe that more persons would be saved if they were born dumb Many individuals are going to be lost, not because of some wickedness that they did, but because of their tongue. Their ability to speak. There is nothing that we can't do. We are made in God's image. He cares about us. He watches over us. He answers our prayers. He is with us every day. Can you say amen? Amen. Last week, I had to pray a prayer. God, forgive me for not seeing your presence that is right in front of me. There's never a time in our lives as we travel as children of God that we move alone. Once you're baptized and you're given, and you have given yourself to God, Satan cannot enter you. Are you listening to me? Because of God, he says, thus far and no further. And for every temptation that Satan brings to us, there's a God watching over us. And that is why he never allows any of us to be tempted above that which we are able to bear. There are temptations that you face that I cannot handle. And there are temptations I deal with that you cannot handle. We all don't have the same temptation. But when Satan comes, God stands in the way first and said, give it to me. And let me see if he can or cannot handle. And sometimes he weighs it down and says, you take back some of that. And gives us what we can handle and allow him to bring it to us. God watches over us. We are incredibly powerful people. For persons who are not in church and not baptized and not converted, Satan has open access to them. But for those of us who are in Jesus, not until we get to heaven, we will realize how protected we are. I don't fear him. I don't fear that I can be demon-possessed. Children of God cannot be. 
We are powerful beyond measure. Because we are converted. We are given to Jesus. He's watching over us. Can you say amen? It's only for us to believe it. And to live it. And to realize who we are in Jesus Christ. And how powerful we are in him. But our problem is, our struggle is that many times we struggle with our consecration and our sanctification. We struggle with coming to a place where we are fully submitted to God. That's where we struggle. Even though we have been called some time ago and we responded to the call and gave ourselves to Jesus in baptism and are covered many times in walking with him, we struggle with making a full submission. You know why? Because we want to do it our way. Not his way. We want to follow our own inclinations. Even though the Bible says that there's a way that seemeth right unto you. But the end thereof is the way of death. We can only trust the word of God. We can only trust the Bible. I cannot trust my own mind. Everything about me before I action it. I have to submit it to God. Because my righteousness in God's sight, my righteousness is as filthy rags. I'm not talking about sins. My righteousness in God's sight is nothing. That's why I have to submit myself to him. But we like to argue with God. And argue with his word. Especially when it goes against our inclinations. As children of God, we are given the Bible by which to measure our lives. And our words and our speech and our action. Can you say amen? We should order our steps and our families and our mouths and everything about us in the word. And we'll be okay. But we like to argue. And so James decided to attack the root of our problem. Our problem many times is not so much the things we like to talk about. Our problems many times is in the tongue. James. James chapter 3. Reading from the Passion Bible. Let me read again. Let me borrow my glasses here and read the word of God again for us. It says, My dear brothers and sisters, do not be so, do not be so eager to become a teacher in the church. Since you know that we who teach are held to a higher standard of judgment. We all fall in many areas, but especially with our words. Yet, if we are able to bridle the words we say, we are powerful enough to control ourselves in every way. And that means our character is mature and fully developed. Horses have bits and bridles in their mouths so that they can control and guide large body. And the, the same with mighty ships. Though they are massive and driven by fierce winds, yet they are steered by a tiny rudder at the direction of the person at the helm. And so the tongue is a small part of the body, yet it carries great power. Just think of how a small flame can set a huge forest ablaze, and the tongue is a fire. It can be compared to the sum total of wickedness, and it is the most dangerous part of our human body. It corrupts the entire body, and it is a hellish flame. It releases a fire that can burn through the course of human existence. For every wild animal on earth, including birds, creeping reptiles, and creatures of the sea and land have been overpowered and tamed by humans, but the tongue is not able to be tamed. May I have another microphone so I can move away from here? Do you, do you have the microphone? Microphone, where, where is it? Is it nearby? Thank you very much. And you can turn this off. James. James understands something that the Holy Spirit led him to deal with. James understands that nothing can destroy a church more than terrible tongues at work. It's not so much the devil, it's not so much the other thing, but it's our tongue. And so James attacked the whole matter of the tongue in the infant church that, just, that Christ just started. 
No, no, James did not say it, but when you examine it, there are at least five types of tongues you can find in every congregation. You'll find them in every workplace, in every classroom, in every conference office, among every pastor and in every church. It doesn't take long. There are at least five kinds of destructive, unsanctified, unchristlike tongue that can destroy a congregation or a church. They are, can you hold this for me, please? Um, they are number one, the chameleon. Number two, the destroyer. Number three, the detractor. Number four, the negator. And number five, the gossiper. Are you with me? Let's see if we can identify them. Number one, the chameleon. Number two, the destroyer. Number three, the negator or the distractor. And number four, the negator. And number five, the gossiper. Number one, the chameleon. The chameleon is the person, is the person who can fit into every kind of conversation. Are you listening to me? People are praising, they praise. People are condemning, they condemn. People are lying, they lie right along. There is no conversation that a chameleon will hear and not participate and fit right into. That person is comfortable in everything. Any group, every group, <laughs> no matter where they are, the chameleon fits right in. Are you hearing me? That's the chameleon. I agree. It is true. Yes. That is how it happened. That's the chameleon. And the next one is whom? The next one is the destroyer. Words have killing capability on the lips of a destroyer. Now there are persons who like to say sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Don't fool yourself. <laughs> words have the ability to destroy. And there are some persons whose words is like a pit bull. You know, I had a dog five, six years. Uh, uh, um, a fox terrier. Tiny, that's her name. A little thing. Beautiful. The only thing I spoke, I, I used to speak to Tiny in sentences. When I come home, I look for her. But a friend of mine came by one day to the house. I wasn't there to visit and he came by, and he's allowed to come into the yard, and he had a pit bull. And I don't know what possessed my friend to leave his pit bull in my yard and run to the shop and came back. And he did not know, but he came and grabbed his dog and left. When I came home that night, 10 o'clock, and I opened the gate, there was no tiny. I have two. I have a German Shepherd and a, and a Rottweiler mix. He's a huge thing. And then there's Tiny. There was no Tiny. The first in six years, Tiny was not at the gate. And I went cold. 10 o'clock in the night. I began searching. Can't find Tiny. So I called. I went to the phone and I called my friend and I said, you were here today, right? Yes. Did you see Tiny? Yes. Did you take her home? No. You need to come over here. Because you brought your dog here, right? Yes. I can't find Tiny. And he came. We found Tiny at the back. Well, at least we found pieces of her. Everywhere. And I did not know I had the ability to cry until that day. But I heard when the anguish came out of me. Because of what that pit bull did to Tiny. Can't tell you the rest of the story right now. And it was on my birthday. On the lips of a destroyer, words are like that pit bull. It can shred people's emotion and lives. And uh, are you hearing me? So we have the, 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 the chameleon and the destroyer. Which is the next one? The distract. Huh? 
the distractor. The distractor, <laughs> you know who that is, right? The distractor, the words of the distractor is yes, but. The distractor will listen to any conversation and any speech, and then they'll wait for the right time and say, but. They will always take away from whatever is being presented or said. What you're saying is true, but. They will use their words to minimize and to belittle. And the thing about a distractor, they never have in their lives a legacy that they can point to because nothing that comes from the lips of a destroyer is ever positive. You praise someone. Yes, what you're saying is true, but there is something you don't know. And they will fill it in and it will never be a good story. As a devil, at, as a distractor at work. To take away, to belittle, to downgrade, to minimize. Next, who is the next one? The negator. The negator. That's the master or mistress of the negative note. Anything that is presented, a negator will say, not so. It can't work. We have never done it that way before. <laughs> not true. That's the negator speaking. It is always negative. But, uh, you know, someone once said that those who like to use the word can't should not interrupt those who are doing it. Those who say it cannot be done should not interrupt the ones who are doing it. Are you hearing me? Yes. I've learned long ago not to listen to negators. If I did, I would still be on St. John's Road in poverty where I grew up. But I've learned to listen to God. And then the last one is whom? The gossiper. No, that's the worst one. The gossiper is someone who will hear anything and will run to and fro with it. How the gossiper operates, the gossiper operates <laughs> with a trash can ear and a loose tongue. People in church know exactly where to take their rubbish. They are not going to take it to any and everybody. And sometimes other persons who want to manipulate know exactly who the gossipers are. And so some persons are clever so they know who to tell so that they can drop it into the grapevine. Because the gossiper is tied into the grapevine. And the favorite word of the gossiper is, have you heard the latest? The Bible is very hard on the gossiper. Over and over again, the Bible addressed the whole matter of gossipers in church. Always running with a story. And the thing about a gossiper, they will never verify whatever they hear. The easiest way to shut down a gossiper is to ask for the evidence. When someone brings anything to you, where are the evidence? Were you there? Did you see? Did you touch? Did you smell? Did you hear? No. But, but, but the thing about gossipers is that they would never be able to survive if there were not other trash can air people in church. Because gossipers don't go to everybody. But they go to those who they know who will receive garbage. Because gossipers never have anything fruitful to tell you. Negators, destroyers, chameleons, gossipers, and distractors. What a motley crew. These are the unsanctified devilish tongues that is in church. And so dreadful is the problem that James concluded in verse 8 of chapter 3. The tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. And I stand condemned under that statement. Because I have a tongue. You have a tongue. You know, Jesus made a pronouncement that caused me to tremble every time. I read it. I better read it from a mod another, from the King James Version. St. Matthew chapter 12, verse 37. Listen to Jesus' judgment on the tongue. 
Here in St. Matthew chapter 12, I hope I got it right. And verse 37, if I don't get it right, I, I can quote it. St. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 37. What it says. I tell you this. That every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. Now if you feel the weight of that, that should cause you to tremble. Every idle word, all the loose talk, all the non-creative, non-redemptive language, every idle word that men shall speak, they shall be called upon in the judgment to give an explanation. That is Jesus speaking. And we ought always to take him seriously. Because Jesus says what he means and means what he says. And Christ understands the power of words. Are you listening to me? In my early ministry, when I started out, I remember in my enthusiasm as a young pastor, I went to this particular church and uh, I started the crusade and the spirit of God fell. And church was filled every night. It was so filled that people were sitting all around on the platform. So I believe that there would be a tremendous harvest. But when it was time for baptism, not many persons were giving their lives to Jesus. We had over 300 visitors. And I, as a young pastor, took up the list when I realized that very few persons were coming and discovered that on that list, most of those 300 persons who came to the meeting were former Adventists. And I decided to visit everyone because I thought that I knew the doctrines. I can explain the prophecy. I believe our, 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 what we believe and I can prove it from Bible. So if they left because of some theological reason, I can show them from the word of God that what we believe is solid. But I never met one person in all the 300 individuals I visited that left church because of doctrine. They left church because of the tongue. Somebody said. Somebody did. Are you listening to me? The tongue has driven more people out of God's church than false doctrines or other sins. The tongue. The tongue can no man tame. It is full of evil. But if you notice in the text, the Bible says the tongue can no man tame. No man can. No man can. No man can. No, James is telling us something. The tongue can no man can. I can't do it. You can't do it. But there's somebody who can. Can you say amen? amen. God can tame the terrible. I can't do it, but God can. And so we have to reach a place in our walk where we come to us pot where we decide to consecrate our tongues and give our words to Jesus. Can you say amen? amen? You need to get to a place where I'm willing that God will take over my mouth and you get down on your knees and you ask the Lord to fill your mouth. God be in my mouth and in my speaking. Not only in my mind but in my mouth. If any little word of mine May ease a toiler bending. God, uh, give me the ability to speak a word in season and out of season. Are you hearing me? When the commandment said, thou shalt not kill, Jesus commented on that. It is not only talking about taking a knife or a gun or a weapon and taking somebody else's lives. But Jesus said you can use your words to kill. That means that when we are in Christ, when my tongue is consecrated to Jesus and I come in contact with anyone at work, at school, and especially at church, when I speak, I must speak life into you. Can you say amen? 
words can cause wings to get behind somebody's spirit who is low and cause them to fly. I remember a few years ago when I just returned, I decided to go back to Jamaica to teach. I, 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 and I went to the university and they, were, they had a very expensive subdivision, the most premium area in Mandeville. I love to go over there because of these expensive, large palatial houses. But my little church salary can't reach that. But I like to look. Because the Lord had given me a little ambition. So I like to eye shop. And one day I stood and they were building this beautiful house. And it was coming out of the ground. And I'm there looking at the house. And up drove beside me Pastor Nigel Lewis and his wife. Nigel greeted me. We were, we were friends in undergrad many years ago. And um, his wife said to me, Denton, that's your house. And I looked at her and I said to her, what's wrong with you? You're a pastor's wife. You understand what we make. How can you dare say to me, that's your house? She said, that's your house. I said, no, not based on our salary. She said, but, I understand the salary, but you are Denton Roan. And they drove off. And I grew. <laughs> and I look at the house. And I look at the car. And I'm Denton Rowan. <laughs> I went to the guy and I said, I want that house. And I got it. Amen. And the Lord provided the money for me to move into that house. Amen. So I left. I stepped out of the US into a large house. And people said, my name, come on with drug money. But it's because if it wasn't for her words, she could have said something else. But she spoke life. Amen. God wants us to give our words, our lips, our speech to him. Can you say amen? The church needs your words and God needs our word now. We need to give our lips to him. It is time for him to come and we have something to do. We have somebody to tell that Jesus loves them. We have somebody to pray with. Can you say amen? We have somebody to encourage. We need to use our words to breathe life into our brothers and sisters. There's a reason why God made our tongue. And there are two reasons. One, he made it for us to praise him. Amen. And to exalt his name. Can you say amen? amen? And he made it for us to give life to our brothers and sisters. Amen. And anything negative that you know that you struggle with. You take it to the Lord in prayer. Amen. There's somebody you know, something going on with them. If you can't approach them because Jesus tells us how to do it, then get down on your knees and give that person to Jesus. Amen. But love everybody and praise your God. The tongue can no man tame, but God can. We don't need any chameleon. We don't need any destroyer. We don't need the negators. We don't need the gossipers. We don't need the detractors. God needs our lips. And once you learn to control your words, and it's not difficult, you pray about it. First, you must be willing. And then secondly, you must pray. And then thirdly, you must submit your words to the word of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Can you say amen? Read God's Word. Read the Bible seven chapters a day until you yourself become a living Word, not the living Word. But you hear yourself thinking, and you're thinking the words of God. You hear yourself speaking, and you speak the words of God. You hear yourself encouraging and you encourage the word of God. Once you learn to let Jesus take control of your speech, change will occur in you. Amen. It will occur in your family. Amen. It will occur in your church. It will occur in your place of work. Can you say amen? amen? Because when the devil comes to you with negative words, once God's word is in you, you can speak to him and say, Satan, you're a liar. Whatever Satan brings to you, there is a word. Jesus said, it is written. And you can say the same. Amen. The devil said, you can't do it. I can do all things. 
through Christ that strengthens me. You are sinful. Jesus said, though my sin be as scarlet, they can be as white as snow. If I'm willing and obedient, there is no money in your bank account. God said, I have been young, but now I'm old. Yet I've never seen the righteous forsaken or a seed begging bread. You're alone. Jesus said that I am with you always, even unto the end of the earth. Speak a word in season and out of season. But speak the word of God. Once you control your words and let Jesus control your speech and you have a sanctified tongue, your family, your children, your wife will be happy. And you will be happy. The tongue can no man tame, but give your tongue to Jesus. Consecrate your speech to Christ. And there's nothing that you cannot do. And there's nothing that you can. The devil will give you negative words, but speak back to him. Sometimes you have to say, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. Sometimes I have to say, get thee behind me, Satan. Even though a friend of mine said, I don't say get thee behind me, Satan. I keep him right where I can see him. So I can rebuke him in Jesus' name. But whatever your situation is, rebuke it. Sickness and, the, and, and some struggle, find a word and put it on it. I done. God bless you. Amen. Yeah. I thought after that someone nobody would speak. But I can I can still hear people talking. Powerful someone and uh, much needed at Houston International. Amen. For me and for every one of us here. I hope uh, we'll take those words to heart and apply them as we journey on this year. Amen. Let us all rise for the closing hymn. It's going to be hymn number 330. Take my life and let it be. And let us meditate as we sing that hymn um, in connection with the song. Amen.